Welcome back class, this is chapter 14, Procedural Justice and Ethics in Employee Relations. In terms of establishing good employee relations, there's a couple things that would be quite important for you to do as a manager, and one of those is to be perceived as a credible boss or a credible manager, so establishing credibility. And then the uh, other thing is to be perceived as a good boss, so using a positive supervisor and managerial behavior. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. I especially wanted to point out that on Blackboard there are a couple documents that you could look at if you wanted to and then write a couple of your entries around these documents. You don't have to, but uh, one of them is behaviors associated with managerial credibility. So that lists a lot of um, behaviors that promote the two factors of credibility, trustworthiness and competence. So you might look through those behaviors and think of prior managers you've worked with or under and uh, how you could relate those to be behaviors to what made that manager either credible or non-credible. Or you could use those sets of behaviors to kind of evaluate yourself and see which categories you're doing well in and which you'd like to improve on. And those you would like to improve on, you can take a look at the specific behaviors that you want to target and do more often or work on. And you could set some goals around that. So those, those that could be uh, an entry in your manager's manual right up for this chapter. But uh, if that doesn't seem to be something that you want to spend time on, that's fine. There's another document on there. I would say the same thing. You could use it the same way. It's supervisor behaviors highly correlated with employee job stress. And it's a questionnaire instrument list 63 behaviors that, that I found to be highly correlated with employees' job stress and to be predictive of employees' psychological well-being. So again, if you don't have a lot of work experience, you could think of a boss that you worked for for quite a while, a boss whose behavior you know well, and complete that instrument as if you were uh, think evaluating that particular boss. Or if you are a boss, you could kind of look through those behaviors and see which of those you think you're doing well on and which you'd like to do better on. And Either way, you may have some uh, material learned from going through that exercise, and uh, it may spark a few things that you want to write about. Okay, I'd like to touch base on something Cassio talks about. It's alternative dispute resolution examples. So he gives some examples of these so-called alternative dispute resolution methods. I'm a big believer in these. I'm a big proponent. Why? Well, I think they act as a safety valve. So with steam engines, if a steam engine built up too much pressure inside it, it would explode, but they would build on these safety valves that if the pressure got high enough, the valve would pop and let off some of the excess pressure. And I think there are instances in the workplace where we need similar so-called safety valves when employee issues are boiling up to a heated uh, situation and where employees are feeling frustrated, they're not getting the dispute settled the way they had hoped, they're getting angry or stressed, sometimes it helps to have an alternative channel for resolving that dispute. So certainly we'd like employees to at least initially start with, the, in most instances, with the immediate supervisor and then if necessary the boss's boss or human resources. But there are instances where employees do pursue those channels but still feel like they're not being heard are not being treated fairly. So some of these uh, alternative dispute resolution methods can be extremely helpful. So I would encourage you to at least consider those, see if your organization has those, and look into those as, a, as an additional method for protecting perceptions of justice in the organization and maintaining uh, positive employee relations. These uh, systems do tend to enhance perceptions of justice. While talking about justice, I wanted to talk about a couple kinds of justice that are mentioned in the chapter, Procedural Justice 
and distributive justice, make sure those are clear. It's not really important in this course to memorize a bunch of terms and things, but I think these concepts, if you think about them a little, will help you maintain effective employer relations in your organization. <coughs> Excuse me. So procedural justice is based on perceptions that are the procedures in this organization fair? Are there fair rules? Are the managers enforcing these rules fairly? Are they following the rules? So with uh, low perceptions of procedural justice, either employees are thinking that the rules aren't fair, or if the rules are fair, that uh, managers don't consistently follow the rules. Maybe they bend the rules for one employee, but not for the other employee. So procedural justice, that would be making sure that uh, employees see that there's a fair set of rules in the organization and that these rules are consistently followed and we'll talk about a few methods for achieving that in a minute or two. Second uh, component of justice that I was going to talk about is uh, distributive justice and that's kind of related to are the outcomes fair. So um, on both of these it, um, procedure I am distributive justice if, if how I'm explaining it doesn't make a lot of sense to you, you might take another look at how Cassio defines it and see if his works better but in this instance the way I think about distributive justice is is the outcome fair so certainly um, things happen in the uh, organization and employees are waiting for an outcome or decision and once that decision is made they think through was that a fair decision? Was it a fair outcome or not? So, for instance, maybe I break a rule or uh, botch up an assignment I'm given such that um, some disciplinary action or a reprimand is necessary. With procedural justice, I'm going to see, did they hear my side of the story? Did they follow the progressive discipline policy? Did they treat me similar to other employees who have engaged in similar behavior. With distributive justice, I'm looking at the outcome. Was the penalty I received fair or not? If you want to think about it in terms of a different matter instead of discipline or poor performance, think about pay raises or bonuses. Um, procedural justice would be related to was I given a fair performance evaluation or my performance objectives fair? Did my manager help me achieve the level of performance that I was expected to attain? Um, were the goals clearly understood by me and the boss? So those things would be predictive of my perceived procedural justice. And then distributive justice would just focus on the outcome or the amount of pay raise that I receive. Okay, um, don't want to belabor those points, but they're pretty important. I noticed that, uh, and I was kind of pleased that Cassio talked about the hot stove rules of employee discipline. I hadn't seen this in years, but it's sort of, uh, it's not a real research oriented or scholarly piece of work, but it makes so much sense and I think it sticks pretty well with a lot of managers, sticks in their minds pretty well that this hot stove rule, and it was kind of interesting to me to see that um, the person who had either come up with this or popularized it was Douglas McGregor. He was the uh, theory X, theory Y person who um, I respect his work quite a bit. Um, wrote some quite good helpful material on uh, how to manage employees effectively. But anyway, I wanted to flesh out those hot stove rules. I don't think they were all in the book. So here we go. According to the hot stove rules of discipline, a reprimand should be immediate. In other words, a hot stove burns the first time you touch it. It doesn't allow you to touch it and then an hour or two later burn you. So the feedback is immediate. A reprimand should be immediate. Second, a reprimand should be directed towards someone's actions, not the individual's personality. So a hot stove doesn't hold grudges doesn't try to humiliate people, doesn't accept excuses. It just uh, burns because of the actions. You touched it, so you get burned. So the reprimand, as I said, should be directed towards someone's actions, not the individual's personality. And uh, as I've heard HR managers talk about, and I 
wholly agree with. You certainly want to stay away from talking about employees' attitudes when you're disciplining or reprimanding, so that's a pretty explosive uh, topic. Focus on behavior, so that meshes well with this second facet of the hot stove rule. Uh, third, a reprimand should be consistently applied. Talked about that a few minutes ago related to procedural justice. So a hot stove burns anyone who touches it and does so every time. Fourth, a reprimand should be informative. A hot stove lets a person know what to do to avoid getting burned in the future. So certainly we want to be supportive and make the, uh, we're not reprimanding just to punish people, we're reprim reprimanding to change behavior and improve performance. Uh, fifth, a reprimand should occur in a supportive setting. It's related to the prior one. A hot stove conveys warmth, but with an inflexible rule, don't touch. And then a reprimand should support realistic rules. So the don't touch a hot stove rule isn't a power play, a whim, or an emotion of the moment. It's a necessary rule of reason. So you might think over this hot stove rules, whether or not they make sense to you, and kind of keep that in mind as a way to guide your actions as a boss, because it will unfortunately be sometimes necessary to take disciplinary, disciplinary action or to reprimand employees. I think those rules will help you do so more effectively. Along those lines also, I wanted to talk about what I think is certainly a key in disciplinary actions, and that is investigation. So when something goes wrong, an employee breaks a rule or uh, performs poorly and it seems to be necessary to take disciplinary action, you want to err on the side of over-investigating. So I've had to learn that the hard way when I was in the industry. Sometimes uh, you think you have the situation figured out and have enough information to take action to hold a disciplinary hearing and discipline an employee and then later you find out there was a bit more to the story than you knew so it's pretty easy to get burned in that way so like I said err on the side of over investigating certainly you're going to talk to the employee supervisor but it's too easy to quit there you want to do a lot of listening to the employee that's involved and probably get out of the office and go out on the work site where the incident happened and talk to some co-workers or witnesses and in some instances uh, you may not want to rush the discipline so in other words you may have discipline pending notify the employee that you're investigating the facts and um, continue to investigate a bit longer so to postpone the actual decision not not for too long and not unnecessarily but enough to get all the facts in because it may be a while before the import or the uh, effects of the employee's action all um, become apparent. All right, uh, Cassio says encourage managers to give honest appraisals if an employee is not meeting minimum standards of performance. He says tell it like it is rather than leading the employee to believe his or her performance is satisfactory. So this is crucial. Why do I bring this up? You may have seen this too. A lot of organizations get burned in this way. Employees aren't performing very well, but bosses who might be high on agreeability or like to be liked by a high need to be liked or conflict avoiders will kind of, to avoid the conflict or to avoid the documentation they would have to produce to verify poor performance, will continue to give satisfactory performance appraisals even when that is not the case or not what should be given and that causes a lot of problems so the employees cruising along thinking that they're doing well there's no need to change then all of a sudden the straw that breaks the camel's back happens there's that one more incident of poor performance the manager gets fed up says I can't have this employee in this job anymore I can't stand this performance or or the company can't have this anymore and at that point company wants to take action, maybe terminate the employee or reassign the employee, demote the employee, whatever, some kind of serious action. And the documentation isn't there, so you can't do anything. If you do some of these more serious actions against the employee, you could be at legal liability or be in trouble with EEOC because you haven't done the homework or the documentation to 
show that indeed this employee is not performing as needed on this position. So it's just um, maybe certainly not the most pleasant part of a manager's job, but making sure employees truly understand where they stand performance-wise and then backing that up with documentation is uh, certainly crucial and you can't always wait to the last minute to do that. Really this is an area where managers need to exercise some discipline and uh, force themselves to document on a regular basis. Cassius says document employee misconduct and poor performance and provide progressive disciplinary policy thereby building a record establishing just cause. So I, whole, I second that, I wholeheartedly support that as well. Document what's going on, particularly misconduct, but also effective employee behavior. Have a progressive disciplinary policy, follow that policy, and that will help you build that uh, record showing that you had just cause for the action that you took and that you did meet the rules of procedural justice. All right, I want to talk a little bit about terminations. Um, I've had to do a few of these in my career. They're certainly not pleasant, but if you plan ahead, and certainly over time with practice, they get easier to do, but um, with uh, careful planning, they become much easier, much more effective, much more likely to boil up into bigger problems. So personally, I've disciplined um, probably hundreds of employees early in my career. And I found that if you stick to the facts, treat the under, other individual with respect, um, stay calm, a lot of times the employee will reflect back your behavior. So have you found that in other instances in life, that a lot of times your, your own deportment or behavior, the way you conduct yourself, can be somewhat contagious? So, Really, I didn't have a whole lot of problems with things boiling up and becoming too heated or emotional, even in terminations. And certainly, I've seen some tears and seen some yelling, but I think um, to the extent that you prepare yourself mentally that what I'm doing here is justified, we've done our homework, it's fair, I know I'm doing the right thing, I'm in a calm state of mind, I know the steps I'm going to follow through here, I know the do's and don'ts, that I'm going to do and avoid doing, uh, that will help you conduct a much more successful uh, termination. And I, I'd kind of like to start by saying I, I really feel you should choreograph terminations. Uh, in other words, um, like a big stage production, those are choreographed. You kind of have to choreograph terminations because they are pretty um, potentially um, explosive situation and we want to think things through carefully, so, so plan ahead and choreograph a termination. I would say, related to something I said a moment ago, ensure interactional justice. So we talked about procedural justice and distributive justice. Sometimes another type of justice you hear about is called interactional justice. So that's, how do I treat you person to person, right? Even if I'm disciplining you, or in this case, firing you, I can still treat you like a human being. I can still treat you like an adult, right? Don't have to talk down to you. Don't have to demean you. I can treat you with a lot of respect. What you may have done may have resulted in your termination, but that doesn't mean you're not a decent human being. And I can convey that without actually saying it by how I interact with you during the process. I'd say have an emergency plan. Nowadays you do hear about these incidents of workplace violence and these things uh, do happen. I don't know that they're extremely common, but uh, they're high consequence when they do happen. So you want to kind of plan ahead for what signs to watch out for that might indicate that could happen. And then some precautions to minimize the chance that that will happen. And if it does happen, What's the uh, contingency plan? Really, I think uh, emergency preparedness is something we don't talk about. We don't do the safety chapter. Uh, can't squeeze it into the semester. But you might look at that at some point in your career, the emergency preparedness for um, all kinds of incidents that ha can happen in the workplace. Some of these uh, rehearsals and procedures and um, 
policies that you can have, how to react to these emergencies can make things go much more smoothly, particularly if you have a well thought out plan. People know who to call, they know what to do, and you practice that occasionally to uh, make sure that it's retained and fresh in people's mind. They can react more quickly when it does happen. That's well worthwhile. So I'd say have an emergency plan, certainly, in case the employee does try to come back to the work site in a bad way. I'd say have a witness. I'm a big believer, and I think most HR people say the same thing. Not to gang up on the uh, person that's being terminated, but sometimes um, lawsuits or complaints to um, government agencies do happen. And employees say, well, during my termination, this person said this, this, and this. Well, really, you, do, you probably want to have a script or a clear plan of what you're going to say. But if you have a witness there, too, that helps in a couple ways. They can back up what you said if something comes up later. And also, if the uh, employee does become a little bit heated, gets out of control, it's sometimes better to have two than just one, certainly. Uh, be prepared for a variety of reactions. So, uh, don't know whether you're going to get crying, you're going to get a feeling of relief, you might even get a thank you, you might get yelling. So just have in your own mind, uh, you, you don't know what you're going to run into, be mentally prepared for any of those reactions. You don't have to react to the reaction that you get. You can kind of be calm and still in yourself and um, do some self-management, not get sucked into that necessarily, to pick up on it. You're not going to be um, oblivious to it necessarily or uncaring, but you don't have to get sucked into the emotions. People are entitled to have some emotion when something like a termination is going on, so I would allow that and um, just kind of deal with it in an empathic but calm manner. Uh, so again, remain calm and then uh, maintain your distance and composure. Those would be my tips for that. So I hope that uh, Casio has given you some good ways to enhance procedural justice and ethics in employee relations. I hope I've given you some useful information. I think employee relations is critical because it, as we talked about early in the semester, does affect employee attitudes, which affects employee behaviors which affects organizational performance and it really affects the kind of work climate that you can create and how enjoyable it is for working at an organization for both employee and manager.